Welcome. This is our 13th episode of COVID Cast JA. And today we're talking about oper operationalization of the PSOJ COVID Relief Fund. So you've heard us talk about the COVID Relief Fund on some of our programs. And today an idea, so a concept of a give back to an actual fund that does the give back. We have a panel of amazing guests. We're going to have Nevada Paul shortly. We're also going to be joined by Safri Brown of the Council of Voluntary Services. We're going to be joined by Dr. Paris Leo Ayi and Brigadier Mason. I will do their proper introductions, but just so that you know that we have an exciting episode, a learning episode, because many times we come up with ideas of give back, but actually putting it into operation is where we stall. More, worse, there is the whole issue of transparency and accountability. We've seen the slowdown of the Jamaican economy with COVID-19 and food security has been a major concern for all of us. In recognition of the economic challenges due to the pandemic, the PSOJ, in collaboration with organizations from the public, private, and civil society, established the PSOJ COVID-19 Response Fund. This is to deliver critical food and COVID-related health relief to those most in need. On March 20, 2020, the fund and its nationwide relief package delivery operation was just an idea. So just note that date, March 20, 2020. By June 17, 2020, the operation has fully scaled up with over $160 million raised, 628 donors globally, 94% of money raised has got, goes to the relief of beneficiaries. 23,031 Jamaicans fed. 16,246 packages delivered. 933 volunteers mobilized. You are asking yourself, how did this all happen so quickly? We're going to be joined by our first guest, a very familiar face, Nevada Paul, who is the Chief Project Architect for the PSOJ Access to Finance Financial Program. Now, Nevada is going to be talking to us about the theory behind operationalizing an idea. Nevada? Hi, how are you doing, Rochelle? Episode 13, congratulations. <laughs> Still in business. <laughs> still in business. And much work to be done. Much work yes. to be done. So Nevada, I am still fascinated at the concept of moving from March 2020 to June 2020. And so much has actually been done. So it, this is moving from idea to yes. the creation of data, mm -hmm. looking into the communities that are necessary. Um, putting the various committees together. So, you know, so my mind is boggled because yes. I know that many times by the times the com by the time the committees come together, all the committees do is meet. How do you actually get to delivering so much by June 20? Take us through a case study that is yes. the PSOJ relief fund. A absolutely. So I need everybody, and Rochelle, you've actually emphasized it, right, to realize the extraordinary thing that has just happened. Because, again, so many ideas that we know, whether in the private sector, the public sector, much less a collaborative effort. You, everybody have ideas, and then it gets sunk in committee. After a while, low energy, people give up, et cetera, et cetera. So the idea that, or the concept that something could come from nothing in March to a fully operational with all of the metrics that you've talked about, this is tops off to an extraordinary team that has done an amazing job of putting this thing together. And much of what we're trying to do on this show is about the learning for the SMEs. One of the crucial things that any SME or any business really has to understand is this whole idea of how do you operationalize an idea. We all have ideas, all have great ideas, but it's the ones who can execute 
that make a massive difference. So we're gonna talk a little bit about what's crucial when you operationalize an idea, and then you'll spend the rest of the show, as you see, talking to the people who actually did it. So call this the theory part before the practicality. So I wanna put up a first slide around some of the key success factors. So first thing, there's gotta be a clear vision. And in this case, the PSOJ COVID fund, as I understand it, right? Build a transparent national operation to raise money globally and feed the vulnerable nationally. So there's a piece of it, which is the fundraising part of it. And that's about building trust, building knowledge around the world about this fund, being clear about what the issues are. And then there's a whole logistics piece, which is buying and sourcing food, packaging the food, and then getting it out to all kinds of areas in Jamaica. So that's the first thing. The vision has to be clear. The second thing, the, you, have, you need to have clearly defined goals. And people always say the vision, what's the difference between a vision and a goal? A goal is what you call very specific things. So you have to say, we're trying to raise this amount of money. We're yeah. trying to act aside. We're trying to raise a certain amount of money. We're trying to feed Y number of families. It must be nationwide delivery. And we need to go from here to there in, in six weeks. What you notice with that is those are tangible, specific things that the organization would be trying to commit to. Then there's the issue of outputs, timelines, and activity. The strategic plan is only the beginning. You need end-to-end -end granular design for each function. So you can kick back and say, yes, I want to deliver food to all the vulnerable. But where are the vulnerable? How is the food? Where are we going to get the food? How will the food get to the vulnerable? Those have to be designed out in an extraordinarily specific way. And it has to have what I call yes, no outputs, meaning that you will know when something actually is done versus this vague kind of, so when you say, boy, we're we trying to feed as many people as we can, you know, that's vague. But if you say we're trying to feed 500 people for six weeks in Linstead, that is a tangible, specific goal. And that is what can galvanize an organization when the goals and the outputs are specific. Clear dates of deliverables. I want to feed 400 people in Linstead by April, right? With a date. And then what activities do I need to do to make sure that happens? So in order for me to be ready to feed 400 people in Linstead, I got to figure out who the 400 people are. I gotta figure out where I'm getting the food from. I gotta figure out who's gonna package the food. I gotta figure out who's gonna take the food out on which trucks to get them to Linstead. And I gotta figure out a schedule as to how all of this comes together. Very clear output, very clear timeline, and very clear set of activities, which then anchors the entire effort. So those are the first three key factors. So Nevada, um, yes. I our viewers are watching and yes. we know throughout COVID, but just generally, because we are, are a giving people, we are a giving nation. Right. And persons will come up with ideas for foundations, for scholarship funds, etc. So this these are actually actually very tangible, a very yes. tangible list of um of success factors that yes. are Applicable not only to the creation of a fund or a, or any kind of NGO, but also right. these are very useful even when you're thinking of your own business. Because when we're running these charities, when we're running funds, we have to see them as businesses with That's very right. clear success factors, deliverables, and accountability guidelines. So Nevada has gone through the vision. The yes. clearly defined goals, the outputs, the timelines, and the activities. So after this, come tired now, because you know sometimes we get to the output, the timeline, and the activity, and we don't move from there. Because the committee meeting about that. How do we now move into the next set? Right. So there's a little joke I always have when I get a consulting gig about people always comment, "Can you help us develop a five-year plan?" So I said, before we talk about a five-year plan, I'd like to look at the, what you had planned to do last year and if you implemented it, because I always say to people, if you made a plan for a year. And you didn't implement your one-year plan. Let us not talk about five-year plan. Let us talk about how you implement a plan. So let's implement the stuff that you said you were going to do last year. Once we are able to implement plans, then let's talk about a five-year plan, right? Yeah. So this whole notion of moving to implementation. So next is this whole issue, back to the slide, of team alignment. You need alignment on the what and the how. And here is what's critical. You need to build trust 
through data-driven decision-making. The most demoralizing thing in an organization, worst of all, if it's a group of people trying to work collaborative, collaboratively, it's when it's not clear why a decision is being made. And worse if people suspect that they're nefarious or other reasons why the decision is being made. So when you take something like the COVID fund, data and data-driven decision-making is absolutely critical because you're bringing stakeholders from all over who are already suspicious about each other. But the moment you can point to and say, this is the reason based on this data that this decision is being made, then it quiets the suspicions because everybody is clear and you are transparent, right? Clarity yeah. of the process, end to end. The governance process must be clear. And you explain and explain again to everyone how the intricate parts are connected. And then of course, the ongoing collaboration. Very, very crucial. The team mm -hmm. has to be aligned on what is being done and how the goals and the methodology driven by data. Then you need to talk about the team that you put together, the capability, and it's two factors. They must be capable and accountable. Meaning by capable, mean they must be able to do it and you can lean on that expertise and it must be real. So not just a bag of talk and accountable means that when they say, I will get something by Tuesday, I'll get something by Wednesday, actually they do it. Because only by having those two things together in the team, will you get an output driven uh, mechanism. And then there must be progress with monitoring and reporting, which is said to everybody, right? Whatever is tracked is what is focused on. So if we agree yeah. that we are feeding 400 people in Linstead in April, then it must be told to everybody that we have fed 400 people in April or we have not. And if we have not, why haven't we? The metrics are crucial to keep them operating. There must be clarity and frequency of reports. So, you know, you don't wait many, many months and you don't know, oh, we never delivered anything to Linstead. Oh, okay. Nobody asked no question. No, it's very clear. Did we deliver 400 packages to Linstead? And then the ongoing messaging to all the stakeholders. In this case, there are many. There are donors, both local and international, who want to make sure their money is being spent appropriately. There are people who are volunteering, who want to make sure that people are, you're not wasting their time. There are stakeholders who are looking at the money and making sure it's properly spent. Many, many, and there's, of course, there's a general public who, who has to hear about the fund and what's going on. Is the PSOJ a bag of talk or is something really happening? So all of that becomes part of what I say about how to operationalize, in this case, a relief fund, but it's not only about a relief fund. Any business, one of the many, many ways in which business fall is that they can write the strategic plan, but they have difficulty operationalizing it. Yes. And for our viewers, if you're just joining us, we are speaking with the lead architect of the PSOJ AFFB project. Um, his name is Nevada Powell. He's a very familiar face. And today he's talking us through the whole idea of oper operationalizing an idea. Now, Nevada, as you are speaking, a couple of things coming to mind, because, you know, in several instances, our viewers may be saying, you know, I have seen the advertisements for various funds. Please um, contribute your money into this bank account. You see the GoFundMe. What we're seeing is that you have to move from just saying I'm going to collect some money because even the vision for what that money will be used for must be very clear. So today we're talking about moving from idea, development of the concept, putting the group together because the collaboration is essential, the follow-up, the implementation, and holding our feet to the fire because yeah. accountability yeah. is key. And Nevada, it was funny that in mentioning the stakeholders, you didn't just mention the donors because the persons who also volunteer their time also need to know, I'm not wasting my time. Yes, absolutely. So absolutely. For those of you who are wondering, um, we've talked about quite a few things. You saw some slides and you're saying to yourself, but where would I find this information? Please send us an email at sme at psoj.org we send out a weekly memo with business tips please ensure that you are on our mailing list and this and much other information is involved in this week's weekly memo so nevada 
what would you like what key message are you going to leave our viewers with at this time as we actually look at the different aspects of the psoj fund data critical supporting all the decisions granular decision making don't just keep things at a very high level but be very specific 400 packages to Linstead is very different than saying we're going to try to feed a bunch of people in need. It's not the mm -hmm. same. It's not the same thing. And then looking for a team that's capable and accountable. So data, granular planning, and a team that's capable and accountable. And so this is what made to this happen. Yeah. We can't just see a problem and say, you know, I feel that we should collect some money to fix this problem. No. So <laughs> your father is reminding us about data, granular, granular decision making and putting that capable team together. And today we're going to hear from some of the very capable team that have managed this PSOJ COVID relief fund from March to June in such a short time, not only collecting the funds, but actually delivering and holding themselves accountable through granular decision making, through putting a capable team together. But we're actually going to start today by talking about data. Because, you know, <laughs> Nevada, much of us don't like to talk about data, you know. But we're going to be joined today by Dr. Paris Ayi Liao. And he is going to be telling us about data and is not just going onto the internet and researching how many people live in an area. But at this time, thanks a lot, Nevada. We're just going no to problem, watch Michelle. a video on the phone so that we're very clear on what this fund is about. Let me tell you about a place where legends are made. Jamaica, tiny island that has managed to captivate the world's imagination. With our music, our food, and our creative minds, we have shaped the course of history on a global scale. Jamaica is the kind of place that touches your heart and follows you home. Once you've fallen in love with Jamaica, Jamaica is home. But right now, our home, our sweet island in the sun, is under attack from COVID-19. The population in isolation who are not able to work need Food. Children are out of school. For those in rural areas, they are having an even harder time learning online. However, we are not about to sit around and watch that happen. As a response, the Jamaican business sector, under the leadership of the PSOJ, established the PSOJ COVID-19 Relief Fund as an urgent outreach to help those who are hungry, at risk or displaced at this time. Guys, 12 US dollars feeds one person for two weeks. 50 US dollars feeds a family of four for two weeks. I pledge my heart for pledge my heart forever forever with So from my heart to yours, we're asking you to donate now. And with us working together, we know every little thing is going to be all right. Please donate to our GoFundMe page, charity.gofundme.com slash stand for Jamaica. Hashtag stand for Jamaica. And we continue to receive your donations. I have to tell you, I just, I really just had goose pimples, um, feeling such a sense of pride being a citizen of this great, great nation. And today we are joined by Dr. Paris Leo Ayi Jr. He's the director at Mona Geo Inform Informatics, big word, Rochelle. Institute at the University of the West Indies, Mona. He holds a PhD in geography from the University of Oxford. He's a primary developer of the Caribbean's first GPS navigation system. He's a joint researcher with the Planetary Sciences Institute in examining rock breakdown characteristics of Martian rocks for a NASA project. He sits on the board of six 
private and public organizations. And today he is going to join us to talk to us a little bit more about the importance of data gathering, the data that was gathered and the results for this PSOJ COVID-19 relief fund. Paris, thank you so much for joining us. How are you? I'm good, Osho. Thank you for having me. So today we're, got, we're talking about the COVID-19 relief fund, and you are responsible for gathering the data that has driven this project. Can you tell us a little bit more about the significance of data-driven decision-making? I think um, Nevada did an excellent job a while ago in explaining to you the different um, components of, of making something effective, that data is just one part of it. It is how you, you, can, you can have garbage data. You need to have the ability to drill down to a particular level for this thing to be effective. But more important than anything else is the team. It was the team that put the data together. It was the team that decided how to put the data in the right order to be effective in a certain way. And it's, it's the team that took the output and the products of the data to where it needed to go, which is ultimately into the hands uh, and, 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 and lives of individual people across Jamaica. There yeah. are so many different elements and people use the word data so loosely, but Nevada spoke about the granularity and that's very important. I use the word scale. It's one thing to say that the X number of people in Jamaica, it's one thing to say that the X number of people in St. Catherine, but you need to be able to drill down, not just into Spanish town, but you want to drill down into a, a, a particular neighborhood and along a particular street. That kind of information really allows for the operationalizing of, of, of any project, of any exercise, the logistics to be planned for this thing to be assessed and measured. All of this is possible through data at all scales and at, at, at different levels. Uh, what we're talking about here is, is, is something so, yeah. so complex. And you speak about my background with Martian rocks. What does that have to do with COVID? And the answer is nothing, except for the part that we're able to process vast amounts of data. But it's going to take a right team to help me. I'm not a real doctor. So how am I going to be able to, to coordinate this type of activity? And it's going to take real doctors. It's going to take people um, from the business community, volunteer community, military, all of these people working together to help parameterize this data in order for it to be effective. Okay. Because this data, what we're actually trying to do is to determine the most vulnerable communities. So in, 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 you're working with some big data, so a vast amount of data. And I know our viewers are wondering, how are you able to, one, how did you gather this data? Where did you gather this data? And then how are you able to break this data down into a usable form to determine the vulnerable communities? MGI has a, a pretty large database, you know, in the in the social social database, physical infrastructural database. We all, have, all this stuff is laying around. It's very easy to get information on population, unemployment, etc. The trick really was to put them all together. When we speak about vulnerabilities, we understand that there are certain types of vulnerabilities that we have to look out for with respect to this uh, coronavirus pandemic. And then when you look at the fact that you look, okay, sure, old people or people with pre-existing conditions, etc. But what about the, the whole notion of social distancing? This is where we, we talk about population density and spacing of people. This is when we yeah. start to begin talking about poverty and unemployment situation. We talk about crime, which may exacerbate a situation and force people to be a certain way in the best of times. And how, how will um, the, the COVID situation exacerbate any kind of, of pre-existing social conditions that we're going to need to be able to, to account for? How do we deal with the fact that people need to go to supermarkets and to get basic services? How do we account for the fact that we need water infrastructure in place to ensure sanitation? How do we factor in the availability and the proximities of health centers and emergency services, uh, essential supplies, all of this stuff have to be put together in one single package. And, 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 and where you would have an area with lots of poor people, you may not have lots of diabetics. In areas with lots of diabetics, you may not have lots of poor people or old people or unemployed people. You want to figure out which areas in Jamaica have all of the above and then begin to measure this. And that's what we did. 
22 different variables, 20 something thousand different combinations. Um, enormous, enormous exercise. And I, I, it's, it's the hardest thing I've ever done, but literally could not have done it without the excellent team at the PSOG. And I mean it, I'm not being, 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 yeah. you know, because I'm on TV. This is, this is real. And, and, and you have some very excellent partners here. And the most rewarding part of it for me is to see what's been done with it. You've, so, you've shown several videos and, and infographics a while ago in terms of how many people reached and how many volunteer hours. That is extremely uh, gratifying because where I ended, all of these guys um, began. And, and, and it's, it's truly, truly um, rewarding. Yeah. And for our viewers, um, it it you know we always wonder the facilities that we have available right here in Jamaica. And through Mona Mona Geo Informatics, we were able to actually gather this information to break down our vulnerable communities. And um, Paris, Doctor Leo, I just went through the whole data process gathering. Um, Nevada Paul spoke earlier about the importance of something like a PSOJ COVID fund to operationalize it, it must be data driven. So as we continue our conversation with Dr. Leo Ayi, who is director at Mono Geoinformatics, now when having put that, pull that data together, you came up with 25 vulnerable communities. Well, we came up with every single community in Jamaica of which we selected the top 25. If you wanted 26 or 32 or 16, we could have given you those as well. And, uh, and uh, the top 25. Okay. Objectively selected the top 25. We didn't pick it based on population or political affiliation or because you like that area because that's where you got married. We chose it simply on the basis of that vulnerability question that you're asking me. If you want to know which is the poorest community in Jamaica, that's not the same thing as the most vulnerable community. If you want to know the, the, um, the community in Jamaica that has the most traffic, that has nothing to do with vulnerability, um, that's another question. But we focus yeah. on vulnerability and we're able to pick those, those top 25. And just again for our viewers, because I think in many instances when we just loosely use the word vulnerability, we're usually using it in association with poverty. That's right. We have to understand that, that in the particular case of COVID, we're also looking at pre-existing health conditions. Poverty exacerbates that, um, but so does crime. Uh, unemployment affects your ability to earn, and then in a situation with COVID, where you're going to have um, people increasing number of people levels of unemployment, you're going to start to see that figure increase. How does that increasing figure affect vulnerability? That's what we're trying to show. It's a dynamic model. It is not static. It is not stupid. It's smart, and we're able to figure out and, and account for all of those different variables in an operational setting. So too often people get a, do a study, you get a report, it's a piece of paper, you put it down and that's it. You want to talk about a dynamic changing situation um, that we're able to tap into. And the PSOJ did tap into, into this, this, this exercise um, with respect to a changing situation and we saw what happened in Anato Bay. Uh, we were able to go into the database here and to see where does Anatobe fit into the grand scheme of things. What will happen now that Anatobe is under quarantine? Where is the yeah. squeeze? What is the effect of the quarantine condition now, which did not exist prior? Right. How does that change things? And that's what we're able to do in a, in a real sense. This is not a mapping exercise. I'm very glad that you never once used the word mapping. It is, it is a data exercise. And, uh, and how that data is moved up and down in a changing world, in a dynamic situation, things can improve as well as get better and both change um, the reality on the ground. And we need that information to make decisions on the fly and immediately. Okay. So in in regard to, to the gathering of this data, because I know many of our viewers are saying, okay, so we started out in March with an idea. Is it that you already had this data and it was just a matter of distilling it to yeah. be able to 
come up with vulnerable communities. Absolutely. And again, you said it earlier in terms of the resources that are already available. And these resources are available. The Monash Informatics Institute is full of, of, of very bright Jamaican UE people. And we're able to, 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 to tap it. You know, we didn't, we didn't create anything out of thin air. All we did was activate what exists it already existed here in the country, and it took the the, the very bright, very uh, resourceful minds of the PSOG and its different members and partners and friends to be able to synthesize that into something of use and of value to this particular exercise. Uh, and, I mean, the reality here is that, and we've said it several times about data, but you know, data becomes information, information becomes insight, and insight becomes wisdom, right? We're just at the bottom of that pyramid. You guys have been able to take it up and, and turn, turn, um, turn, you know, raw, dirty carbon into diamonds. <laughs> and um, this, this, this diamond has now resulted in several communities across Jamaica being able to benefit from the COVID relief fund. But of course, it started not with a hand in the air trying to determine That's where right. should we start. That's it didn't absolutely. start with that. It didn't start with a political affiliation or I just happened to like this community. It was all data driven as the fund sought to identify the most vulnerable communities and identify 25 most vulnerable, vulnerable communities. Dr. Leo, we just want to thank you so much for joining us and you are a part of the team and as Nevada mentioned, you have to have that team that is collaborating. But this is amazing, too, because, you know, as and we have many viewers from the diaspora from all over the world. And it is important for us to know that for something like this, we didn't have to wait three months to go overseas. No. Someone to gather the information. We had it right here. So thank you very much, Dr. Liao. And I think you will be staying around with us for a little longer so that you can answer some questions. Thank you very much. Thank you. So uh, what, what a stimulating discussion. You know, it is amazing the resources that we have right here in Jamaica when we stop to ask what do we have because we have some of the brightest minds right here in Jamaica. And some of these minds have come together for the PSOJ COVID Relief Fund. And I know as many of you are watching, you're saying to yourself, oh, wow. So who was at the helm of this team? Who had to be thinking about this night and day? And at this time, we need to introduce, and I like to call her the Safri Brown, chairperson of the Council of Voluntary Social Services. She's also one of 25 global leaders to represent Jamaica in the prestigious Eisenhower Fellowships Global Program starting 2019. She's co-founder and head of innovation at The Leap Company, which seeks to catalyze the impact business ecosystem in Jamaica and the Caribbean. She's also a Columbia, Columbia Business School alumna. She is a leader in social enterprise development and corporate venturing within the Caribbean region with 20 years, so don't look at how young she looks, 20 years of social responsibility experience within the United Kingdom and the Caribbean. And I think it's very important that our viewers understand the background that SAFRI is coming with, because in many instances, when we are working with charities, volunteer organizations, NGOs, we don't recognize that it takes a certain level of skill and experience and knowledge for it to be successful. And today we're talking about the team that has been behind the PSOJ COVID relief fund. So so for everybody's wondering, so who was the person who was like thinking about this night and day? <laughs> and <laughs> pulling all these documents together. And many of you would have seen various videos and stuff with Safra in there. And she has been integral in operationalizing the COVID relief fund. Safri, now in March, yes, of Rochelle. <laughs> we know Keith Duncan that he will come to you with this big idea in March and say, in about six weeks, we would like to see this fund, money collected and this fund off the ground. Now, moving from this idea to a concept, to pulling people together for the fund to be mobilized. Can you tell us a little bit about that journey? 
So, um, you know, I think, uh, I think when uh, Keith first came with the idea, um, I don't think any of us around the table at that first conversation really understood the volume of what his vision was. Um, and so I think when we sort of uh, initially agreed, sure, you know, this would be great to be involved with, and we, and, and we started, um, I think within the, within the first sort of two to three days, we were very clear, or I was very clear, what the expectations were in terms of the vision. And that really was to try as much as possible to ease the burden of our fellow citizens during the COVID crisis. And remember, we were very much, right? The tourist industry had just shut down. Uh, 250,000 people had just been um, made unemployed or sent home indefinitely. And, and, and for the first time, you suddenly recognize that you may not be able to call on all your international partners for as much money as you may possibly need because everybody is hurting and everybody is struggling. And this was the first time that globally we really needed um, we really needed to look within, we yeah. really needed to look locally to provide our own solutions, um, and then we also needed to um, to have a real commitment to everybody that we were doing the very best we could for them, and that included not just the communities, that included our donors, um, that included our partners. You mentioned our volunteers, anybody we deserved to give um deserved for us to give them the very best and so uh we initially looked at well what is the structure of the fund um and again this is this is why it's always great to do stuff with private sector because you uh private sector can mobilize um really really sort of um top level expertise yes. um and so pso did mobilized um some some attorneys uh, mark harrison and and patrick mcdonald to come and help develop the, the structure um we then looked at what should be uh, the relief, what is the purpose of the relief? We looked at food security and health and we recognized that that would become a big issue. Um, and then we looked at the overall kind of fundraising, the project management, the reporting, um, and these sorts of things. And that's how we really looked at the team. So, you know, uh, we've pulled together the team. We all kind of just pulled together in the different areas. Who's good at this? Who's good at that? And what we found is that everybody, I don't think there was one person that was asked that wasn't willing to really get on board and support because I think everybody recognized the gravity of the situation. Um, and so I think that the willingness, not just to say they would be involved, but for people to really get involved in a fulsome way was a huge yeah. part of that. So uh, being able to mobilize the right people to come on board was a huge, huge, huge part of that, um, of our initial um, uh, momentum to yeah. really get going. And then, I mean, it, it, it was meetings. I mean, I think that I've had enough of Zoom. If I don't go on Zoom ever again, it'll be too soon. Um, because, you know, we had meetings, we had small meetings, we had mammoth meetings, we had, I mean, we were meeting all day Saturday, all day Sunday to really try and get it going because it was an urgent um, activity. You know, I've done a lot of grants management in my background. I've run foundations both here and in the UK. And you have months, you have, yeah, you, you know, you can take six months to set up a grant scheme. You can take a year, you can, you know, do all these things and, and take as long as you want. But this one, we felt the longer that we took, the more people um, would, would suffer. Mm -hmm. And so we saw every day as a day that was actually a real emergency. Because I think that's so important that you mentioned, because as, as you're speaking, I'm saying to myself, okay, this is in March. So the idea came to the table, say March 20. And it was mobilization of a lot of different skill sets and expertise. And what usually happens is we're able to get people excited about a concept. We are able to mobilize people and we form some committees. And I think everybody's wondering. So between March and June, yes, you met on Saturdays and Sundays. How did you actually get these committees formed, accountable, doing their work and actually delivering on what their particular role was for us to get to June and be able to talk about things that have not as a concept of delivery, but things that are delivered, that people are benefiting from the fund. How is that possible? What yeah. did you do? Yeah, I mean, we had, you know, we had a great driver in Keith, right? I mean, Keith really held us all to account. Um, yeah. and, uh, and I think that was a big help. And I also think that, again, the, the urgency of what we were dealing with was also not lost on any of us. Um, and then I think, as you know, it was interesting because um, Nevada mentioned earlier that there was tangible, right? And, and once things are tangible, you're held to account. And there were these commitments made 
um, to ourselves and to others that this is what we would do. And once those commitments were made, um, you know, we all, everybody involved, the project management team and everybody involved really made sure um, to live up to that commitment. Also, um, part of it was trying to keep up with Keith, though, because you have to recognize in the PSOJ, by the end of April, uh, the uh, partners had, ra had, ra had raised $80 million already. So the money was coming in. And what it meant was that the structure needed to be there to support it in terms of now the relief allocation. Yes. So, you know, the, the, the fundraising almost was a little bit of the easier part. And it was really now the structure of the, you know, creating a very transparent mechanism creating a mechanism that provided open reporting. Um, again, when you have limited resources and when everybody is feeling um, the pinch, uh, you're gonna have people saying, oh, well, what about this community? And we need resources here. And why aren't you supporting this one? Um, and so being able to have that mechanism through the data, but also through the relief allocation committee, which is multi-sectoral made up of uh, representatives from public, private and social sector, being on there to say, this is the thinking behind the decision making for NGOs and areas and so on is an important component of that fund. Um, if we didn't have the structure set up properly, there would have been too much pressure to constantly answer questions that we couldn't have answered. Whereas we can answer any question about any decision that's made at any point. And, you know, it, it doesn't allow for, for as, um, as Nevada said, nefarious um, you know, oh, you know, we need some resources here. It doesn't allow for that. It's not built that way. And the other thing is that because it's very structured and open, everybody is aware of how it works, right? So the minute you deviate from that, people will see. And so this is why transparency is also very important because it also protects you as a resource mobilizer and a fund. It actually protects you from those kinds of things because it's clear how it works. And so I think all of that is part and parcel of what we're doing. But at the end of the day, the, the the, the, the motivation has continued to be getting the support to the communities. And, you know, apart from the 25 communities where we use the data, we also provide funding to NGOs across Jamaica delivering relief um, to very specific uh, populations. For example, um, Jamaica Association for the Deaf, Jamaica Aid Support for Life, um, the Boys Brigade. You know, these are organizations dealing with some of our most vulnerable population. Um, and so, again, making sure that that uh, that we moved quickly enough, that we really could support them at the peak of when they needed the support, not on the downside of when it was sort of, of when. Yeah. Okay, so one of the things um, I know people are asking is, what's actually in a package that you've delivered? Okay, so, um, and you know, we're getting a lot of questions about, well, how can you feed somebody for two weeks with this? I want to be very, very clear that this program has been developed with a lot of in-kind support. So yeah. a lot of the products, um, for example, National Bakery gave us all the crackers and 20,000 kilos of um, sugar. You know, uh, Jamaica Flour Mills has provided uh, the flour. We've gotten great um, donations from Carimed and Kendall and Grace and, you know, lots of them. And then we've also had, um, in terms of logistics, amazing donations from private sector as well. We, you know, the way warehouse, which is, I don't know, 20,000 square foot warehouse, was yeah. provided by um, Sampas. Um, so they've supported us with that. That's for, that's not, um, we're not being charged for that. The trucking, Jamaica Customs House has provided the trucking to get the packages out to the communities. Um, and so it's a real group effort that allows us to, to really get these packages um, done at a, at a lower cost. So in the packages are things like flour, rice, sugar, cornmeal, uh, mackerel, salt fish, um, uh, Lasco food drink, uh, soy food drink, mm -hmm. um, cooking oil, as I said, the crackers, um, you know, and some other things. So the, the, the food, is food, food, and, food. And, and health. So it, it is a, it is heavily right. based, yes. Right. So this is what happened. I mean, and this is why when you do disaster funds, you need to be able to pivot very quickly, is that um, initially we thought it would be sort of an equal food security and health. And if you remember, everybody's, a lot of uh, the early response from others was towards health. And, and PSOJ itself had mobilized the private sector to raise 150 million for the ventilators. Yes. And others had gotten very involved in that. Once we really started to roll out the fund, we recognized that, the, that, 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 a, that a huge demand had to do with the food security or food insecurity, mm -hmm. and that we needed to, to really just focus on getting food to our, our communities. Um, for the immediate future, we wanted to do it in the medium term. So we didn't want to just give somebody a package once 
Um, and then we didn't really help get them over what was maybe a two or three month hurdle. Okay. Um, and so people on the food relief program, get they get the packages four to six times. So once you are recognized as being in need and needing that kind of support, you actually get that package every two weeks um, for two or three months. Uh, because okay. then you're really providing a relief versus a kind of one-off. And the minute you get the package, you're already like, oh my gosh, what am I going to do in two weeks? What because we do? Do. Right. And whilst that meant that we didn't get to as many beneficiaries um, as as we would have we would have liked, what it did mm -hmm. mean was that we were really able though, to provide more in-depth to support um, support. And each package, as we said, helps two people. So once one person gets it, they help. They're able to use it, you know, with a family member or so on. Um, to be able to go ahead and get that kind of support. Yeah, and just to acknowledge some of the comments we're getting, Blondell Wilson Henry says, good afternoon, great to be learning so much. Jamaica has so many excellent citizens. Romeo Stewart says, our entire country came on board for this initiative, I will definitely donate. So it really is creating an impact for us to be discussing how this initiative actually works. So before yeah, we- and I, did, I wanted to say something with that, Rochelle. And I, I want to talk a little bit about the media partners, right? Because, you know, media yes. partners are very, very important at a time like this. Not to not to advertise and promote, but to actually share the um, the results of what you're doing. For transparency, it's important that you have media partners so you can get information out there on how much money is being raised, what you're doing with the money, um, so that people see that. So, for example, on a Thursday this evening, every, every Thursday at 8.45 p.m. on CVM, you, there's an updated infographic on how the fund is doing. And that's not just the donors, that's for anybody in Jamaica who wants to see how the fund is doing every Thursday. And this has been going on for the last uh, six weeks. You see that update. And that has to do with, again, our transparency, accountability, and open reporting. And all our other uh, media partners, RGR Glena, Love FM, uh, Jamaica Observer, we really have been extremely fortunate to be able to communicate the impact through them. Okay. And, you know, as you mentioned, that level of transparency, to achieve that level of, of granularity and transparency, it means that your reporting structure, so it would have started with the data that you would have gathered, the team that you've put together, and then when you get into the granular details of even how you report to be able to provide specific numbers to the public, not just to your um, your initial stakeholders, but you've treated the entire public as stakeholders. Can you tell us a little bit about the reporting structure that supports the success of the fund? Yeah, so we have very clear monitoring um, requirements with regards to um, from the time, you know, from, from the packages that are prepared. We can tell you exactly how many packages are prepared, how many are in the warehouse, how many went out for distribution today. Um, we can track exactly the number of volunteers, the number of volunteer hours. Um, we can track the number of mo the, the amount of money that's come in, the number of donors, the number that's corporate, the number that's individual, the number that's um, in kind versus in cash. And all of this is really, really important. Again, um, because of the fact that globally the world was um, facing a huge challenge, you had to make sure you stood out. Um, as extremely credible, because what we saw was we saw yeah. this really being the development of very strong relationships and that we saw support coming in waves, right? And the initial wave would be those organizations and companies that are part of a network and, you know, you can pick up the phone and call the CEO and says, yes, we'll support it. But the second wave was going to come from people who saw the impact of the fund. The second wave was going to be was come from those who are holding on to their funds, their limited funds, because it's so difficult right now for everyone to decide where they wanted them to go. And only when they saw the level of accountability and transparency and impact being created, would they then be willing to hand over those results. So all of that is very um, essential to how we operate. Um, and this is an yeah. area, I think, that, that really stands out. And again, the reporting is every week it's updated. This is not a end of two months, you get, you know, an advertorial in the paper and that's it. This is this is real time. And today, actually, Thursday is the day that everything is updated. So okay. by the end of today, yeah. you go on the different websites and see the updates. And then we have the CBM update at 8.45. Um, and then we communicate by Friday. We're all posting the, the, the information on our social media um, and accounting for exactly what's happening. Okay. So for our viewers, if you're just joining us, we're talking about oper operationalizing the PSOJ COVID-19 relief fund. So we actually started with kind of a theoretical structure of how you do that kind of operationalizing. And now we're talking to team members who were critical in the actual operation. 
So we are joined by Safri Brown, who is chairperson of the Council of Voluntary Social Services, and she's one of the um, persons who are at the helm of managing and leading this project. So Safri, um, what I would, you've, you've mentioned a second wave. So persons would have seen that money was collected. They would have seen exactly how the money was allocated and who benefited from this money. So we're pretty much in, as you mentioned, a second wave. Um, in terms of the second wave, what would you like to leave? What message would you like to leave with our viewers at this stage? You know, I think I think it's important um, to, well, you know, we'd love everybody to, to support and donate. You can donate via going uh, standforjamaica.com or at AFG, theafg.org if you want to donate by credit card or go on PSOJ website and it tells you a lot more um, and support. But I think it really is, you know, just to recognize that, you know, it's funny because I've had people saying, you know, Safra, I want to help, but I don't have that much time or people saying, well, I don't have much money. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I just think that at a time like this, everybody needs to play their part, but they don't necessarily need to do everything, you know, um, and and recognize that, um, you know, every mickle maker muckle isn't just about money. It's also about time and knowledge and uh, and effort and support. Yeah. Um, and if you see organizations and people out there really trying um, to make a difference at this type, just having support, um, I think, is a big, big component of that. Yes. So as so we continue to collect donations mm -hmm. and you will know um, it the donations go to charity that GoFundMe campaign stand for Jamaica. You can work where how how do people donate? So if persons want to donate right now, they can just go onto the website and they're able to make their donations. Yes, or if you're low, if you're in Jamaica and you want to do it by a wire transfer, you can go onto PSOJ.com org um and it has the banking information and what happens is the funds are managed by united way of jamaica um who provide and again the financial reporting is as robust as the impact reporting every week yeah. finance a financial report is um is prepared uh every thursday every tuesday by 12 noon it's prepared and it's sent out to the fund oversight committee members um by united way of jamaica and so that really helps again with financial accountability knowing where we are um, and so on. And what we do is we have a lot of donors that, 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 that give considerable amounts through the bank accounts, but they don't tell us who they are. If they want, they want to get the emails, please, your email, so that we can make sure we're giving you regular updates. Um, you know, but it's really heartening. You see small companies donating 50,000 um, or 100,000 for small companies, and you recognize how much of a sacrifice that is at a time like this, um, and how much of a responsibility we all have to make sure that we are we are proper stewards of the funds that people are giving us at this time because it is such a difficult time and I don't care who you are it is a difficult time for everybody I mean you know two weeks after the tourist industry was completely shut down we were getting um, we were getting a lot of money from the tourist sector and that in and of itself is testament to the support um, that that, yeah. that companies feel at this time and give. Yeah. And, and, and that's so important for us to understand because just getting back, and you know that Jamaican saying, every mickle make a muckle. So this is not about just having big money to donate, but every mickle make a muckle and everything is going to help our fellow Jamaicans. And Safra, you can just correct me if I've left out any of the partners because I think it is very important. You've mentioned some of the key partners, Mona, Ge Geoinformatics Institute, and we, doc we spoke to Dr. Liao earlier. They were responsible for data anal analytics operation. Price Waterhouse Cooper for the financial modeling for the relief fund. The Jamaica Defense Force that designed the relief logistics, and I'm sure a lot of you want to know about that, and we're going to be joined by Brigadier Mason, who's going to tell us about those logistics. The Jamaica Constabulary Force that led on the distribution of relief packages, United Way of Jamaica, the administrators of the fund, the American Friends of Jamaica supporting with fundraising in the diaspora, Intelligent, the social media company promoting the fund. So thank you very much, Safri. And I know you're going to be backstage that we'll bring you back on so that we can have a wrap up conversation. Thank you so much. Thank you so much oh, for your time. And we look forward to the continued success of the PSOJ COVID relief fund. And 
as Jamaicans, you know, every time there is there there is always that time that we remember. But for the grace of God, there goes I. So as we're looking, we must remember every mickle make a muckle, and the fund is doing very real tangible things to help the citizens of Jamaica. Now, many of you, as you're watching, you're saying to yourself, okay, we've talked about the data, talked about the administration of the fund, the reporting structure, transparency, accountability. But when we mention, and just to remind you of the number, $160 million has been raised so far from 628 donors globally. 94% of the money raised goes to relief of beneficiaries. 23,031 Jamaicans fed. 16,246 packages delivered. 933 volunteers mobilized. At this time, we recognize to the work of the Jamaica Defense Fund, and we're going to be joined by Brigadier Mason. But before, just watch the next video as we welcome Brigadier Mason. The PSOJ COVID-19 Response Fund would like to acknowledge the outstanding contribution from the Jamaica Constabulary Force, JCF, and the Jamaica Defense Force, JDF. They have shown time and time again that when Jamaica needs them, they will always answer the call to serve as a protector for all citizens. Partnering with the PSOJ in Jamaica, and distributing some of the packages that they have put together along with some of the partners to people who are in need, especially since we also are um, affected by COVID and we've had quarantines and we've had lockdowns and people just haven't been able to do the normal things they do. So it's a great gesture, I thought, for the police to partner with PSOJ and together along with the Jamaica Defence Force and other volunteer agencies reaching out to older people, people who may have lost their jobs, provide just something that could tie them over for a little while. Due to their combined efforts, the COVID-19 Response Fund has been running efficiently. They distribute food, supplies to the less fortunate communities, ensuring that residents do not have to leave their homes to get the resources they need. The JCF and JDF also protect all resources against theft from outside sources so that all supplies can arrive safely to the doors of men, women, children, and the elderly who need it to help survive the pandemic. On behalf of the PSOJ, our stakeholders, and the people of Jamaica, we want to thank the JCF and JDF for working with us and pushing this initiative so that all Jamaicans in need are protected and provided for during this difficult time. Please donate to our GoFundMe page, charity.gofundme.com slash stand for Jamaica. Uh, an additional contributing factor is thorough and specific logistics that dictate the actual operation of distribution from receiving donations to the delivery of packages. And we are joined by Brigadier Mason of the Jamaica Defense Force, who led on and was integral in the whole logistics of the operation. Brigadier Mason, you know that when we talk about logistics, and I know you hear it all the time, we talk about logistics for just about everything because we like that word logistics. In a project such as this, can you tell us the kind of logistics? So when you hear the idea, you are brought onto the program and you're now an integral part of the leadership of this program and you are responsible for the logistics. What does this involve? Hey, good, good, good afternoon, Glenn. Thanks, thanks for having me. The logistics is really the, the art and science of, of coordinating resources to, to, to meet and end. Um, or to meet an aim. The, this, this project has been really a fantastic one and um, I was really happy um, to have been brought on board. The Chief of Defence Staff um, asked me to join the team and I, um, I did so and it has been a truly um, remarkable experience um, so far. The Essentially, the, 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 the scope of the project um, would have been articulated. Paris would have, Dr. Paris um, would, um, would have led on the provision of the data yes. that was 
really critical in guiding the logistics planning. And uh, for the for the JDF and most militaries, we normally use a planning model, mm -hmm. um, which we call an estimate process, and then it, it's 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 followed through at the end with the, the actual plan. Okay. So it was um, simply a planning that that schema using the aim the factors, um, what we call the, the courses open, which are you know the options available, and um, to go into into the planning. Okay. Um, so in, 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 in designing the logistic system to support this project, what was some of the input that you had in the design of that system? Okay, so I think best I'll just I'll just walk through the the scheme of the um the, the planning model so that it is it is quite clear. The uh, the aim really was to mobilize the the resources, the agencies in particular, um, to to deliver these these packages to okay. the the selected communities, and um, the so we have to look at the lay of the land, and immediately it was quite conducive to utilizing the the, the constable of forces command structure, which. Um, comprises the different areas and divisions across the, the parishes. Um, I okay. said there were 19 police divisions and the plan mm -hmm. is still engaging um, for, the, for the early communities selected. It would have been um, 11 of those divisions. So it comprised about seven of the parishes and 25 communities. Mm -hmm. they, we also would have looked at the the COVID spread itself, so we would have understood where most of the concentration would have been, would have been primarily in St. Catherine um, and, and Kingston and St. Andrew. Okay. The, the other um, agencies which were, were, were critical in, in coordinating the resources of the, the PSOJ and the um, agencies making up the COVID response fund, the CVSS led by Safari, tremendous group, the you know, United Way of Jamaica, there was the JCF, and I knew um, the divisional commanders very well. Um, the okay. uh, government uh, ministries, Ministry of Labor, um, and there was the 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 other agencies such as the the, the municipal the municipalities for relief departments and of course the red cross salvation army um and food for the poor who were all um very experienced in delivering support to vulnerable communities so it was a matter of getting these agencies together going um, to visit sites because the plan also entailed establishing um, packaging and distribution hubs um, okay. to, to facilitate putting the, the stuff together and for the transport to get them out to, to the respective communities. The, um, the, the, the CDCs were also vital in, in assisting and working with the police. The churches would have been... Um, exceptional in in identifying where exactly the vulnerable persons were. Um, and so this would have been the group of persons that we would have coordinated meetings and to decide on a, on a plan as to where to go first. Uh, okay. And the, we did have a pilot project, a pilot launch, which was very important you know, in causing us to be able to work out all the kinks yes. we would have launched in the into the 25 communities so i know as our viewers are watching and i see a, a message here from kim Mayer, awesome work psog and cbss and all the partners and contributors for this just this amazing coordination and as you're speaking about the logistics 
which includes the packaging and the distribution, the transportation, pulling all of these various units together, pulling the churches together, the Red Cross together, food for the poor, looking at where housing so there's so many elements so i'm i'm this is between march and june also including a a pilot project and i know our viewers are saying how were you able to coordinate this logistical effort over these several weeks how did you manage those meetings to keep the momentum going but also to deliver on the promise of getting those packages into the hands of our citizens well, you know, I'll, I'll just mention two things. One was it's just the tremendous Jamaican spirit. Um, I tell you, we have amazing people, and uh, to see everybody was willing, willing and, and ready to go because we do, we do understand the gravity of the situation. Even without COVID, there are communities um, mm -hmm. that would would have been struggling. Um, the one of the statistics would have indicated one of the variables of violence would have indicated that seven seventy five percent of violent crimes the communities covered um, seventy five percent of these communities yeah. and so they, they, the tremendous Jamaican spirit came together P people had ideas we learned from the 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 volunteers, the Red Cross, um, Food for the Poor, Salvation Army, they came, they gave us their advice about the, 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 the rate at which we would best plan to work. And also the other agencies came on board with their resources, their trucks, people. Um, so it's just that tremendous spirit that came together. Um, and the communication, I tell you, the this COVID environment, even this platform that we are now using, it was an, it was an amazing platform mm -hmm. to coordinate. We were able to hold meetings with the police, with all the volunteer groupings, with the all the agencies, um, the SDC, the people were able to um, just come on board give up their ideas and just to start working. And so the the communication and listening to each other and the and the community spirit was all um, you know, those were the ingredients that, that got the team together. Yes. So I had indicated some principles because before you embark on any mm -hmm. you have to consider the culture and the principles um, to guide the operation. And we um, articulated that the plan needed to be simple, needed to, to, to be accountable because we had to account to the donors yes. for the monies that they were putting into the program. We had to be neutral of any political influence. And this is why, though we consulted with and um, informed with of courtesy the political representatives, it in no way influenced how the distribution took place. Yes. That consider the safety of the volunteers and put all the measures in place um, to provide persons with hand washing stations, sanitizers, uh, masks, and so on. The communication had to be good. So, as I said, this platform, regular meetings, scheduled meetings, um, the economy of the resources, this was really something that um, the private sector of Jamaica. Um, really drill down into minimizing the resources um, to get the project going. Mm -hmm. um, and also the public buying. We listened to the public, consulted with them. And one of the things that we endeavored not to do was to cause persons to have to um, congregate at any location. And so the JCF was, is, is tremendous and continues to do tremendous work in being able to move from house to house to deliver these um, packages. Yes. And the overall effort would have been a great learning experience for both the, the JCF and the JDF, because we were able to really get up um, and close into a lot of these communities um, that we operate in daily. And for the public, 
to see a different side of, of the organizations. Um, you know, law enforcement organizations, there's, ten, there's a tendency to have an antagonistic kind, kind yeah. of relationship. And so um, when we mobilize to, to help vulnerable persons, you know, mothers, fathers, um, grandparents, um, it does um, make a tremendous difference in, in how we are able to to function and do our duties going forward. Yes, and Brigadier Mason, I really have to thank you because I know as as persons are watching the program, you delivered some very useful tips that the plan must be simple, accountable, neutral of political influence. The communication is key. The resources that you employ, and very importantly, the public buy-in. And we would just like to thank the Jamaica Defense Force and the Jamaica Constabulary Force for the stellar efforts behind pulling together the logistics behind the PSOJ COVID Relief Fund, efforts which continue. So thank you very much, Brigadier Mason, for joining us. I Thanks, think you'll come back to us shortly because I'm seeing some questions here. In the meantime, I'm going to mention a poll that we've had. So our first poll. Have you donated to the COVID-19 Jamaica Response Fund? 13% of our respondents said yes. And no, not yet. 87% have said no, not yet. And we are taking the no, not yet to mean that you're on your way now to make a donation. This is for our people. This is for Jamaica. How did you first hear about the COVID Response Fund? Friend and family, 37% of our respondents said this. Social media, 63% of our respondents. So we're seeing the proliferation of social media. We're actually on a Facebook Live platform right now. And throughout COVID, we've had to be using the technology. At this time, we are going to see another video. So let's just watch this next video. And then we're going to bring back our panelists. I just want to take the opportunity to really thank the Jamaica COVID-19 Response Fund. It's not just important, it is absolutely necessary. I'm excited about this opportunity. And the reason I'm excited about it is because I've actually been sitting there thinking, what can I do? I realize now more than ever that we need each other. We cannot do this alone. We realize that we have to band together, come together, stick together and execute together. So we will continue to be our brother's keeper. So the fact that PSOJ has stepped up to organize this and is working with the government of Jamaica to really provide this safety net for the people who need it most, the most vulnerable people in our population, it excites me because now it gives anybody the opportunity who has even one dollar to be able to be part of saving Jamaica. It no matter what you can give, the most important thing is to give. Because when it comes down to it, it is about saving Jamaica, point blank. Call your friend, make them know this is going for Jamaica. We have to stand up together, stand up for each other. Never in our history has something been more urgent, critical or important. Never. Stronger together, stronger always. Jamaica, land we love. The land of wood and water and good art people. Mother Road. Please send all donations to our GoFundMe page and check out our website to monitor the progress and campaign and see what your donation is going towards. Stronger together, stronger always. We are rejoined by Safri Brown, who is chairperson of the Council of Voluntary Services and Brigadier Mason of the Jamaica Defense Force. Um, Safri, one of the questions that was actually just WhatsApp to me was, you mentioned that there are some committees that were involved in the overall operation and persons just want to get an idea of the types of committees that led this operation. Okay, so the first committee is the what we call the Oversight Committee. That's the Fund Oversight Committee. Um, that one is chaired by the president of the PSOG and uh, a member of United Way of Jamaica and has the other partners on there. And that's really to look at the funds. 
to make sure that the, and the resource mobilization is happening. And then what we have is we have what you call the different work streams under the Fund Oversight Committee. One is the Relief Allocation Committee. The Relief Allocation Committee, um, which is chaired by Greta Bogues, um, the CEO at PSOJ, um, and the work stream leader, Shelly Ann Francis, who's the executive director of CVSS, is responsible for relief allocation. And what they do is uh, they work with um, local NGOs and partners uh, who want to apply to the fund, but also in terms of overseeing the actual um, distribution and um, delivery of items to benefits. Um, and on that, right, so you've got organizations on there like Food for the Poor, Jamaica Red Cross, um, you've got some private sector on there, PSOJ, Sajikor, um, JMMB Foundation. You've also got Ministry of Local Government, Ministry of Labor, Ministry of Health, Ministry of Culture. So really multi-sectoral. And the Relief Allocation Committee is supposed to identify, well, not is supposed to, but does identify and say, yes, these are the areas of need, or we don't think that this area um, really needs support, we recommend over in this direction. And their recommendations go up to the Fund Oversight Committee, who, in terms of the money, signs off and says yes, It shows that things will be spent properly. We're, we're, we're satisfied with the reports, the recommendations. Then you've got the fundraising committee, which is chaired by um, UWJ, um, Ian Forbes. So Ian really um, helped pull together you know, um, some of the fundraising efforts by all the different partners, all the different partners involved in fundraising. Um, and then you've got the uh, marketing and communication committee, which is chaired by Kalando Wilmot um, of Verb Communication and supported by Cloline. Daily, who is the um, head of marketing at PSOG. You've got marketing and reporting, which is shared by myself and supported by mm -hmm. Annalise Freckleton, who's one of the managers. And Annalise was quite interesting because, you know, we'd been about into the project about a month and things were really starting to get um, a little on top of me. And I got this email, CVSS got this email from a, a volunteer on a Monday morning saying, hi, I have project management training and a PMI and I wanted to volunteer and that was Annalise and uh, she has been absolutely phenomenal and been a huge resource so um, and again the volunteers that have come on board have been incredible and then we've got the logistics committee which is really chaired um, by Chris Picknell of Tankwell. Chris has done a lot of on board and help us mobilize um you know ordering and supplies and he's the one that broke the relationship with uh with stampers and 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 um and that whole thing and that's supported obviously by brigadier who really is in terms of on the ground logistics you know the one who has clear oversight for that so those are the work streams and then at the base of all those work streams is the project management team uh which okay. is you know myself um and uh, we got another great volunteer woman named susan cephas uh who helps manage all the donor volunteers because a lot of the donors are giving funds, but they also want to come and volunteer. They want to send their staff out. They really see it as an enriching and rewarding experience. Um, and then we've, you know, we've had lots. And no, she's a, she was a, a corporate secretary, so she's come on board to help us with our record keeping. Because again, especially the fund oversight committee and the relief allocation committee, we want formal minutes that can show the the decision making and who was there and so on and so forth. Um, and Shelly Ann Francis, who's our ED at CVSS, is also a big part of the project management mm -hmm. team. So, you know, that's kind of it. Um, we, Clolin, as I mentioned, really helps with marketing and Tashna. Um, and these are all the people who really make this happen. Nolly Moses came on board as well and really helped us with marketing. Um, and so, you know, uh, this is... This is the whole machinery and persons who actually also reached out to volunteer their services. This is remarkable. Correct. And, and and so this is what you found. Again, this goes back to the accountability, right? Once something is transparent and people see that it that that it's open and it's accountable, they want to be a part of it. Yeah. You know, and this also, I mean, in terms of uh, we have Tracy from um, Tracy Lacroix from PSOJ, who is the finance manager there. She really helps lead on that. And Anthony Brissett from UWG deals with the day-to-day -day finances and the money coming in and the paying of the invoices and doing the purchase orders and um. So it's it's everybody really involved yeah and as you as you know i'm i'm seeing a question here too from one of our viewers and brigadier mason so we've heard about the machinery that is this the covid relief fund and it's very important that we understand that 
for these funds to work and to be effective and not just be a bunch of meetings for years with nothing being done. It does require keeping the momentum, the accountability and ensuring that that team is together. And Brigadier, one of the things, and I, I, I so fun that this question came up because I had to say to myself, going through all of this logistics planning, what are some of the risks that you had to plan for and manage in the process? Well, I think most, most of the risks, I, I, would, I, would, I would say it's threefold. Um, one is to ensure the, the accountability um, of, the, the, of the, the process. So at every stage, um, the checks and balances had to take place on, on both end, ends. The, the other risk would have been just in terms of of the neutrality and most of the risks are going to be in in line with the principles that you would have established mm -hmm. the, the neutrality was was also very important um because again the credibility of the project could would go um you know just with one um bad bad media publication Yes, and and so we had to also make sure that the independence of the program um, held true, held true, and this also would have been um, helped by the work that was done by by Dr. Paris you know, um, in making sure that the variables um, it was clear and transparent the variables that he derived to. To make sure that nobody could accuse the program of, of having any political bias. Yes. We could demonstrate the, the variables which were, would have been used, the age of persons, the, the poverty, the health condition. And so all those details would have ensured that the risks would have been mitigated. Yeah. And of course, um, the team itself, you know. One of the remarkable things is the the respect um, that persons who volunteer their services um, afford to each other, and so you you have no instances of persons being unprofessional on site, and people just came and just worked as a team, and so those would have been the ingredients that mitigated any any risk or fallout of the program. You know, yeah. precise planning. If you say I need a truck and I need it at 10 o'clock and then it is going to arrive at 11 um, at the place, at the destination, then you, you try as best as possible to stick to those, um, those timings. And so it gives the overall um, process um, good, good credibility. Yeah. And thank you for those words, Brigadier Mason, because I think it is so important. And I note that each of our panelists, so we had Dr. Paris Leo Ai, he had to um to jump off to go to another meeting. And we just want to thank him for being here with us today. And he talked about the data analytics that was necessary, the gathering of the data, which was right here in Jamaica, done by Mona Geo Informatics, right here in Jamaica. So we we're able to pull the data together. But he also mentioned that it was about team and keeping that momentum going, which is so critical to the success of these exercises. We have, um, Brigadier Mason has been talking to us about the logistics, the scheduling, getting the packages from packaging to storage, to actual delivery, transportation and delivery, and the involvement of not just the Jamaica Defense Force, but the Jamaica Constabulary Force. And we really are grateful for their support and the support of our volunteers. So Safri, I'm just going to give you the last word today as chairperson of CVSS and just at being at the helm of this project. Um, you've talked to us about the communication, the transparency, the accountability, the amazing team that has come together and given of their time, people reaching out and giving of their time and the importance of keeping that momentum going. We're talking about a, an idea in March that has led to actual distribution. So people have received the packages by June. What would you like to leave our viewers with today? Well, people got their packages by May. We actually rolled out in the first week of May. 
to the first six pilot communities. So <laughs> it really, it really took uh, five five weeks. Five weeks from the inset conversation, yeah, to rolling out in the first set of communities. Um, so what I think is, you know, you know, I was just listening to Brigadier and he was talking about this level of respect and professionalism. Um, I think that you know, all of us involved in this project, or pretty much 90% of us have never worked together. Most of us have never met. Um, and when I tell you the camaraderie on this project has been absolutely extraordinary, to have so many people that you, you don't know that you've never worked with, to work so cohesively together, um, has to go back to that sense one of shared vision, but also these, have any no people on this project, right? We have problem solvers. Everybody on this project is a problem solver because they're problems and problems, you know, every day there's a problem. Some of them are big, some of them are small, but we don't have any blamers. We don't have any, well, that's for you to figure out. Everybody has come on board to really solve. And so I think that's an important component when you're talking about teams and you want to do something that is successful. You want something to be successful. It has to be about building the right team, building the right team culture, Mm -hmm. um, and having that shared vision. And without that, I mean, there's implicit trust in, 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 in sort of 20, 30, 40 people together. There's implicit trust that exists um, that you don't have to run down. You don't have to follow up. You don't have to be like, well, I don't know if Brigadier did this, or I don't know if, you know, SSP, Lindsay did that. We trust, We you know, and, and so I think that's an important part. For me, it's a really important um, mm -hmm. lesson uh, and again, I think that I think that the greatest success factor for this would meet for me. Um, if you ask me what it was, it would be the team, and it would be the the makeup of the team, and then the vision. Um, and so moving forward, I think that 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 anybody that doesn't recognize the value of creating a strong and cohesive um, team that's moving in the same direction, the helm of anything. I guess is not where you have one star and one person that dictates everything. This is a huge, huge collaboration and you must be respectful. You must be open to ideas. You must be accountable. No matter where you fall within this whole structure, you're accountable to everybody. Mm -hmm. um, and I think recognizing that. So, you know, when I make a mistake and Brigadier says, well, Safri so and says, oh gosh, Brigadier, I'm so sorry. All right, I'll fix it. And then Brigadier does, you know, the same thing. It doesn't matter who you are. Um, I think that's an important lesson for everybody to take on. Yeah, mm -hmm. and and really, thank you for those words because it 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 you know, notwithstanding the vagaries of COVID nineteen, it is a, it's such a positive note for us to recognize the expertise that resides right here in Jamaica, and when we come together, we can move mountains. We can stand together. Mm -hmm we can stand always. And we really have to thank the team from the PSOJ COVID Relief Fund. And we just wish continued success and cohesiveness of this team, because we know that this is all truly possible. So our viewers, we just want to thank Safra Brown, Chairperson of the Council of Voluntary Social Services, Brigadier Mason of the Jamaica Defense Force. We also had earlier Dr. Paris Leo Ayu, and he was responsible for pulling together the data for the initial analytics to determine our vulnerable communities. And we also had Nevada Paul, who is the lead architect from the PSOJ Fund. So thank you very much, Safri and Brigadier Mason. And we wish continued success of the PSOJ COVID Relief Fund. And viewers, if you do not currently subscribe for our weekly memo, our weekly memo, please, email us at sme at psoj.org. And just to remind you, it's taking us right back to the key success factors of operationalizing an idea. And this is whether you're working with an NGO, a charity, a fund, this is for your very business SMEs. A clear vision, a very clear vision. Clearly defined goals. How much money are you seeking to raise? For a project like the COVID Relief Fund, how many families are you planning to feed? Outputs, timelines, and activities. Team alignment on what and how. Very importantly, team capability, output driven. Progress, monitoring, and reporting. We've heard from our panelists, our panelists have talked to us about the communication transparency, accountability, keeping that momentum.
but a suspension of egos and self for the benefit of team a team working for the benefit of the people of jamaica and just to remind you that so far by june 17th 2020 so the idea was birthed march 20 2020 by june 17 2020 the operation has been fully scaled up with 160 million dollars raised 94% of the money raised goes to relief of beneficiaries. 23,031 Jamaicans have been fed. 16,246 packages delivered. 933 volunteers mobilized. And this great work continues. So thank you very much for joining us for another episode of COVID Cast JA. This is episode 13. We look forward to seeing you next week for episode 14, 4 p.m. on Thursday, right here on Facebook Live, the PSOJ Access to Finance page. See you next week.